Oh, it's been a good morning, has it not? Amen. Amen. Great theological question. Did the shepherds need shades? We'll have to... I bet they did. I bet they wish they had them, that's for sure. We come to a point in our worship hour where we're going to just pause for a moment to pray for those on our list. I would remind you that um, Chloe Simpson is our person of prayer for this week. So Chloe will be lifting you up this week as you go through your week. There was a prayer blanket... It's okay, over here. There's a prayer blanket over here that I would encourage you to come up and to pray over or in just a moment as we go to the Lord in prayer. That blanket is going to be going to Jerry Sheeler. Jerry was diagnosed with stage 4 liver cancer and so we want to uh, lift him up as he's going through this process of dealing with this cancer. Also see Kevin up there. Kevin, it's good to see you, man. He, uh, in, in a text conversation this week, said he was feeling better and appreciated the prayers and the prayer blanket. So just another reminder that those blankets bring hope and encouragement to folks. So let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father God, we do come before you this morning humbly approaching your throne, recognizing who we are in comparison to who you are. But Father, you've called us to bring our burdens, to cast our cares on you because you care for us. And so, Lord, we come to you at this moment lifting up those who are on our prayer sheet, those who are experiencing troubles and trials in life, those who are going through some health-related issues. Father, we lift them up to you. We lift Jerry up to you. And God, pray that you would comfort and surround him, be with the medical staff that is working with him in this cancer. And Father, we pray that, again, he would experience your presence and your peace during this season. Father, we continue to lift up others in our church. We thank you for Kevin and for his ability to be here today. And Father, for John Shotwell in the earlier service after surgeries. And Lord, I pray that you would continue to just heal bodies. Father, we lift Chloe up to you. We thank you for what she means to our church family, for the various ways in which she serves here in this body of believers, and pray that you would be with her this week, that she would experience a special touch from you. And Lord, now as we continue to look into your word in this Christmas narrative, God, we pray that you would begin now to open our hearts and our minds to be receptive to the message that you would share with each one of us individually. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Take your Bibles this morning and open them up to Luke chapter 2 and keep them open this morning. I'm going to have you flipping around just a little bit, but this morning we are continuing in this series of Advent and we're going to unwrap the gift of joy this morning as we've already heard a little bit about with the lighting of our Advent candle. We're going to unwrap this gift by looking at the proclamation of the angel to the shepherds as well as through the eyes of two other players in this birth narrative. And so with your Bibles open to Luke chapter 2, follow along with me beginning in verse 8. And this is what we read. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Well, it is with this proclamation from the angels that night of good news that will cause great joy for all people that I want you to keep in mind this morning as we travel back just a little bit. Take your Bibles and go back just a few pages to the very last book of the Old Testament, Malachi. And actually, we're going to look at the closing of that book. So look at Malachi chapter 4. Because this is some important scripture to see and to remember as we look at the larger picture this morning. In Malachi chapter 4 verses 5 and 6, it, it tells us how we kind of arrived at this moment. And Malachi says, these are the words of the Lord, See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you 
before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn, and this is where we're going to see in just a few moments here in Luke again, He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. Flip back now to Luke chapter 1, and you're going to want to be there in just a little bit. But can you imagine for just a moment what it was like for the Hebrew people at this time frame, especially when Malachi was written and then leading up to the proclamation of the angels and the news as the birth narrative begins to unfold? It is in Luke and Matthew, we, we flip a page. We go from the end of the Old Testament, Malachi, to the first page of Matthew in the New Testament, and we forget that there are 400 years represented between the turn of that page. 400 years from the time of Malachi to when God begins to speak to the Israelites. It was 400 years of no news. It was during those four centuries where God was silent. He didn't speak. He didn't prophesy. Nothing was said to the Israelites in that time period. And so oftentimes, you know, we have that saying, no news is good news. This is one of those moments where no news was not good news because 400 years have passed. Waiting... I don't know about you, but waiting is a difficult thing for me. It, it seems like it always has been. Do you remember what it was like to be a child at Christmas? Maybe some of the children here are already thinking about this. But that, that time frame between Thanksgiving and Christmas for me growing up seemed like it took an eternity to get from one to the next. Even Dr. Seuss wrote about it in his book, Oh, the Places You'll Go. He talked about times of waiting in our lives, seasons of waiting. This is one of the things he wrote, waiting for a pot to boil or a better break, a string of pearls or a pair of pants or a wig of curls or another chance. We simply find ourselves at seasons in our life waiting when we're waiting for a loan to go through or maybe even a divorce to be final. We're waiting for the results from a biopsy or we're waiting for a soldier to return home. We're counting down the days until we say, I do. I, I had a conversation briefly with an engaged couple yesterday. I looked at the guy and I said, how many days till you get married? He said, it's, 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 um, it's less than a year. I looked at her and, and I said, how many days? And she said, well, according to my app. Yes, there's, there's an app for that. <laughs> But we, in waiting, we, we count down. We find ourselves waiting for babies to come, our due date. But whatever it is we're waiting for, the time between can seem like an eternity. The longer the wait becomes, the less hope I have and the less peace I have. And as my hope and peace begin to decrease, so does my joy. And I can't help but imagine... But this is where the Israelites found themselves during this ye these years, these 400 years of waiting on God to speak to them again. Waiting on God to say something, to break that silence. And after four centuries of no communication, God finally breaks through and we see that taking place as his story of redemption begins to unfold here in Luke chapter 1. It is in Luke 1, 5 through 25 where we see this story of a priest by the name of Zechariah. And we see how an angel first appeared to Zechariah. It's in these passages that we see God beginning to reveal his plan of redemption. Zechariah and his wife are both descendants of priestly lineage. And in verses 6 and 7 of chapter 1, we discover three important facts, three important pieces of information that are necessary for us to have when it comes to Zechariah and Elizabeth. The first thing that we see is that they were both righteous, which meant that they, they were both in a right relationship with God and they sought to live their lives according to God's standards as they knew them at that time. The second piece of information that we are told is that they are childless. Elizabeth has been unable to conceive and so she and Zechariah have no children. And the third piece of information is really important because it says they were very old. 
Now, I don't know about what old looks like to you, but you just think about what old is and then put a very in front of it, and that's where Zechariah and Elizabeth were. Righteous, childless, and aged. I'm assuming that their lineage and their righteousness and their age was a sign also that maybe they had some maturity and some wisdom to them. I'm assuming that they understood the scriptures and the prophecies about the Messiah. Who better to understand that than a priest? I mean, each time the priest would go in to make sacrifices on the Day of Atonement, sacrifices for the people, they had to be reminded that one day this would no longer be necessary. And so we hear about, as we go through this story of the angel appearing to Zechariah, that one day while he was performing his priestly duties in the temple, an angel appeared to him. Look at Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 11. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. And here it is. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. He will be a joy and a delight. In other words, this child would bring them joy as well as happiness in their life. Have you ever thought about the difference between joy and happiness? Because right there it's two different things when the angel pronounces this birth to Zechariah. Happiness, delight, as well as joy. What's the difference between the two? It's so often and easy at times in our lives to confuse and to, to mix them together. Maybe you haven't thought much about it, but I, I thought about it this week as we've thought about joy and so I want to share just a few things with you, the differences between the two. And the first is this, happiness is a result of what happens to me, where joy is the result of what's produced within me. Happiness is cause and effect. Something happens and it makes me happy. You get picked to be on the team or you receive a good grade. Maybe you're asked to the school dance or you graduate and you get that real job. Maybe you buy that new car or that house and it makes you happy, at least for a little while. But on the other hand, your emotions can swing any way they want and all of a sudden you find yourself not being as happy about those things. They may even make you sad or angry. All of a sudden the practices and the time consumed in being on that team and you begin to wonder, is this really worth it? You have that dream job and all of a sudden you're required to work a lot of overtime and you wonder, is this what I bargained for? That new to you car is sitting in the parking lot and it gets a big dent in the side of it and nobody leaves a note. And all of a sudden you're not as happy about that car. That dream date for the dance might have ended up feeling more like a nightmare. <laughs> and it wasn't so happy after all. Happiness can be a fickle emotion that comes and it goes pretty easily and quickly in our lives. So what is joy then? If there's a difference, what, well I can tell you first of all what joy is not. As the Bible describes joy, it is not a matter of our circumstances. Joy is not a matter of our position. It's not a matter of our popularity or even our pleasures. Joy comes, Scripture tells us, through a relationship with God. In Scripture, we see that joy is a gift. It's a characteristic of the Holy Spirit living within us. It's a gift that the Spirit brings to us when we invite Christ into our hearts. Galatians 5.22 begins to list those gifts. The gifts of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, patience. Those first three, though, love, joy, and peace, they have more to do with our relationship with God than anything else. And as a result of our relationship with God, we are given the gift of joy in our lives. It's a byproduct of what we receive when we invite Christ into our heart. Joy gives us an inner contentment that's not dependent upon our external circumstances in any form. 
It's why James was able to say, consider it pure joy when you encounter trials of various kinds. Because it's not about what's outside, it's about what we experience within us. The letter that Paul wrote to the church of Philippi, Philippians, is all about joy. This theme of joy runs through it. Even in Philippians 1 verse 11, Paul wrote, May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation, that fruit being love and joy and peace and patience that the Spirit brings to us. And then we look in Philippians 4.4 4, and Paul wrote, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. And to put that another way, it would read, Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice in Him. As you read that letter to the church at Philippi, you would think that maybe Paul was sprawled out on a beach somewhere, sitting under an umbrella, just enjoying writing this letter. But the opposite is true. He was actually in a prison cell. But even in that cell, he was able to write about the joy that we have because it isn't something that we just have as an emotion. It's something that is deep within. It's something that is deep within us as a result of the Spirit. It's, per, it's a permanent experience. It's a lifestyle for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. Happiness is the result of circumstances. Something happens, it makes me happy. Joy is the result of the Holy Spirit living within me and nothing can change that. Happiness is defined by facts where joy is defined by the truth. When our checking account has money in it at the end of the month, we're happy. When our children have made it through an entire week of school and we haven't received an email from the teacher, we're happy. When our team is winning or we receive a good performance review from the boss, we're happy. It's based on the facts that we know. If the facts are good and in my favor, then I'm happy. But what about when the facts aren't as positive? When we receive the unexpected bill at the end of the month or the heating system goes and all of a sudden that money that was there is no longer available, are we still as happy? What happens when the following week the teacher skips the email and goes straight to a phone call to us? Are we as happy? When your team goes on a losing streak or your boss becomes demanding and unappreciative, Sometimes the facts aren't so good. They don't line up in our favor. And what once made us happy no longer brings us delight. The facts don't always convey the truth. We see this played out in this birth narrative with Zechariah. The Israelites had not heard a word from God in over 400 years. And then God breaks the silence. He breaks the silence by sending not just any angel, but the angel Gabriel to make two birth announcements. One to Zechariah, another to a virgin by the name of Mary. And when the angel shares this news with Zechariah that it's going to be wonderful, it's going to bring joy and delight, Zechariah questions it. He hears the announcement. He looks at the facts. The facts are this, Elizabeth is childless. The facts are this, we're very old, past childbearing years. And so Zechariah questions, he said, how do I know this is true? Because the facts tell me otherwise. How do I know this is true? He doesn't believe what the angel says and so he wants proof. Zechariah is asking for evidence because he knows those facts. Never mind the facts that are right there beside him. Never mind the fact that he is one of 24,000 priests who happened to draw the lot that allowed him to go into the Holy of Holies that particular day. And now in the Holy Holies, the angel Gabriel has shown up and begins to speak to him. Never mind the fact that the angel knows he and Elizabeth's life and that he's bringing an answer to prayer. My guess is it had probably been quite a few years since they had prayed for a baby. They had probably given that prayer up a long time ago. And so for the angel to come and to say, I'm here to answer your prayer, it probably threw Zechariah for a little tailspin. Why even consider the fact that this angel is telling him that the prophecy from Malachi is now going to be fulfilled through the son that he and Elizabeth would have? I mean, how much proof does Zechariah need? And so we see Zechariah who's needing proofs because the facts don't line up for him. But yet when Mary received a word from the angel Gabriel that she would become pregnant and give birth to the Messiah, 
She believed it to be true and simply said, how will this be since I'm a virgin? She didn't say, this can't be, I'm a virgin. She said, how will this be? Because I am a virgin. She believed the truth. She had grown up knowing the prophecies. She had grown up over all of these years hearing about how God would send a Messiah one day. Probably had even heard from the scroll of Isaiah about a virgin who would give birth. Mary knew all of this. And so when the angel says, you're the favored one, you're the one who is going to deliver this child, she simply says, how? Since I'm a virgin. I know it's true, but how? Mary believes Gabriel and simply desires to understand. The facts in our situation may not be an indicator that happy times are ahead. So how do we know? How do we have joy no matter what? And especially when the facts are dark. We have joy by putting our faith in the truth of God. We have joy by clinging to the promises that we see revealed throughout Scripture rather than in the facts that are right there in front of us. Happiness is insecure where joy is confident and constant. Happiness is a moving target. I don't know about it for you, but it is for me. The list of what it takes to fulfill my happiness is constantly changing. I mean, it may be one thing yesterday and a new thing next week. I don't know, but you can ask Debbie. She'll tell you one of my favorite pastimes when, when I'm trying to de-stress, decompress, when I just really don't have anything I have to do, I'll be sitting there scrolling Craigslist because I like to dream. I like to look at things. I like to dream about newer toys. <laughs> I mean, I have a motorcycle. It's a wonderful motorcycle, but it's 19 years old, almost 20 years old. And it's not a touring bike. I'd really like a touring bike one day, you know. And so I scroll Craigslist looking at touring bikes and dreaming about one day having a touring bike. Just a couple of years ago, I was satisfied looking at a 15-year-old touring bike. But my goodness, technology and options have changed, Jason. They're so much nicer today. And so where once I would have been satisfied with a 15-year-old bike, now I'm thinking, oh, no, no, no more than five years old now. Because things have changed. It's a moving target. What makes me happy? What once made me happy will no longer do it. My desires, which feed my happiness, is constantly changing. Proverbs 27.20 says, Death and destruction are never satisfied, and neither are the human eyes. Isn't that the truth? My contentment today becomes my source of complaint tomorrow. My happiness is insecure. It always needs to be fed. Joy is confident, though. And the standard for our experiencing joy never changes. One of the ways in which we discover joy in our life is not by asking, will, what will this do for me? Will this make me happy? But rather asking, will this honor God? Because it's not about my happiness, that changes. But will this thing, will this opportunity honor God? Asking what will make me happy is just a temporary fix. But asking what will honor God, I know, is constant. On the other hand, the more I focus on honoring God in my life, the more I focus on honoring Him and my relationships and in my desires, the more He controls my desires and my decisions. That's exactly what we see in Mary's response to the angel. As best we can tell, Mary didn't say, Pregnant? Uh, what, what are the people going to say? What are the neighbors going to think? Mary didn't say, Wait a minute, what's this going to do to my life? How's it going to change my life? What she did say is this, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. Because Mary understood happiness changes. But joy, joy is constant. Joy is ever present. And so when we seek after God's will and God's desire for our life, the more I learn to cultivate joy in my life, the happier I actually am. God is unchanging. 
He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So when I seek after Him, when I follow, when I chase after an unchanging God, I experience an unchanging and constant joy in my life because Scripture says nothing can ever pluck me out of His hand. Psalm 16 8 through 11, the psalmist wrote, I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With Him at my right hand I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful ones see decay. You make known to me the path of life. You fill me with joy in your presence with eternal pleasures at your right hand. We're, we were created to experience joy. But when sin entered into our lives, that joy went out the window. Sin, we were seeking after our own pleasures and our own desires. What will make me happy in this situation? And it got us into a mess. But in the 15th chapter of John, Jesus talks about our abiding, our remaining in Him, our staying connected to Christ. <coughs> And with Jesus, if we will remain in Him, He says we will experience complete joy. In John 15, 11, Jesus said, I have told you this so that, you, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. So if you want to have complete joy in your life, then it begins by a relationship with Christ and then remaining, abiding in Him. Happiness and joy are valid emotions that oftentimes can feel like the same thing. But at the core, they're very different. Happiness is a feeling we experience based on what makes us happy, what happens to us. It's based on facts and is insecure. But joy, joy is produced in us through the indwelling Spirit of God. It's defined by truth and it's constant which is why the angel was able to proclaim to the shepherds, I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Because that invitation to enter into a relationship with him is open to all people. So have you unwrapped the gift of joy this holiday season? Or are you still searching for it through things that only make you happy?